guests, another one of our two Texas Project board members will moderate the panel and uh, be sure to listen up for their action item in our Q&A. Just one second, guys. We're having a little technical difficulty up here. set up and started. Hi everybody, my name is Chris Betts. I want to say thank to you to, thank you to you all for coming out tonight, talking about passing the torch to the next generation of leaders. So what I want to do right now, we don't want to take up everybody's time, we want to have a good night, a fun time. If we can bring up our speakers, we got John Doyle, if you want to come on ahead and come on up here. Round of applause is okay. speakers introduce themselves. You guys have a cap of 10 minutes, so keep that in mind, John. Um, but uh, you don't have to take the full 10 minutes. Be as effective or as efficient as you want to be, as quick, uh, but not as long as you want to be. So um, let go, go ahead and pass over here to John Doyle. It is a wired microphone, so this is going to be interesting. Here we go. Go ahead and talk about yourself, what you're doing, what you're working on in the future, etc. You know, I was actually anticipating on getting special treatment and being able to go over 10 minutes and what I wrote out, but... My name is John Doyle. I do a show on YouTube. I work with different media organizations. I speak at different campuses across the country, work with different uh, organizations such as this throughout the country. And I got started right after I graduated high school. I was kind of watching the way that the right-wing media apparatus was operating, and I thought that maybe I could have something to introduce, maybe you could throw my hat in the ring. So I got started shortly after that. I was covering various protest content. You know, this was in the early years of the Trump administration, and so we had lots of uh, pink hats, lots of things like that. And so I started out doing that, but as I continued over the last few years, I've been more involved at the local level, uh, more involved in sort of the behind the scenes level, doing different things like that. So um, I was told to speak a little bit about ways that we could be optimistic for the future. And so I had four points in particular I wanted to go over. Uh, in terms of how we can make ourselves a stock of people that is better equipped to go up against what is arguably the most sophisticated power apparatus that the world has ever seen, which is referred to in our circles as the globalist American empire, sometimes uh, the gay, if you will. And it's really troubling because whether it's, you know, you're trying to watch a football game or you're just going to get a cup of coffee, I mean, anywhere you go, anywhere you're walking, you're going to see that flag, that flag which stands to represent basically the American empire and its utmost values, which are anal sex and genital mutilation. And there was a word in German, I don't know if you're familiar with the German language, but my French teacher actually used to have a coffee table book and it contained all of these very long German words which seek to um, illustrate very specific concepts in the language. Like one I remember was when you make a paper airplane and you throw it and it does not travel the distance that you wished it would have traveled. And the German language actually has a word for that. But anyways, the <laughs> word that they had was a word to describe the way that under uh, the Nazi regime, anywhere you went in Germany, whether you were trying to buy a Mercedes or get a cup of coffee, you would see the flag of the Nazi party. You would see the swastika. We have the same thing in this country. And what that does, it's a way of reminding people who is in charge, what we're doing, and what the regularly scheduled programming is going to be. And so to a normal person who doesn't really pay close attention to politics, they're puzzled by this. They think, well, why do I have to see an advertisement that says football is gay if I just want to watch the Cowboys game? Well, it's because that is a way of communicating to the population who is in charge, what we're doing, and really it's a way of humiliating and demoralizing you. I mean, imagine being a normal person, an American patriot, and you can't even watch a football game anymore, something that is a staple of American culture, 
You can't even watch that anymore without being reminded this is what we're doing. And so you look at things like that, and I don't even recognize, you know, believe it or not, I am old enough to have been able to see the change. I don't even recognize the country I grew up in. I know my parents don't recognize the country that they grew up in. And so if we are going to establish a stock of people that can go up against that power apparatus, that empire, it really does start not only at the local level, but even at this sort of like double local level, being yourself, and are you capable of doing that? And there are a few things that we are up against uniquely that previous generations weren't in the sort of cyclical nature of history, one of which being our health. I'm of the opinion that the two biggest issues that we face as a country, as a people, are immigration and health. Because both of those issues affect the stock of people, the people we have in this country, the nation. I mean, it's most positive and most productive resource is its human capital. And so there are things that are going on right now with our health that are unprecedented. A lot of them have to do with what is in our water, not only fluoride, but also residual estrogen from things like birth control. It is literally altering the hormones of people. And when you alter hormones, specifically in men, you make them more agreeable. You make them fatter, you make them weaker. And if you look for it, like imagine if you drop somebody from the 20th century, we'll say the former half of the 20th century, into modern America. They would be so astonished and intolerant by of what they are seeing that they would probably do something illegal. And we don't want that. <laughs> so the point is to say, in order for this sort of culture to be sustained, it does actually require a group of people who have had biological warfare waged against them to make them more agreeable, more complacent, more passive, less willing to take a stand against things that they know are wrong. And there's actually, there have been studies that have shown not to be like a source bro or anything, but as you decrease testosterone in men, you can actually decrease the size of their amygdala, which is the part of the brain that says, no, this is wrong. Conservatives have been shown to have larger amygdalas than liberals. Men also have larger amygdalas than women do. And so this is like a very real method of chemical and biological warfare that's been waged against people. I mean, I don't think, I know the government's incompetent, but I don't think it's an accident that all of a sudden testosterone in men is down like 40% in the last four decades. I think making men more feminine is a, is a way that they can actually institute all of this on people. So I think making sure that you're not drinking tap water, eating foods that are real, trying to avoid garbage in general is a pretty good way to go about that. The second thing I would say is it's very important to read history. A lot of people think that they're going to inform their politics by reading the popular political books of the time. That's not true. You need to read history. There's never been a group of men who have been able to accomplish anything significant in world history who were not stocked by people who were stu uh, good students of history. So that's very important as well. A lot of times we get too focused on philosophy, economics, all very important, but ultimately history is important because we are not above our cycle of history. The third thing I think that's very important, I actually got in trouble with a certain college organization for saying this at a certain event of theirs, and I'm on their blacklist, but it is objectively true. You have to embrace your local right-wing extremist. Mm -hmm. This is why we lose. We are so afraid of being called that that we're not willing to allow good people to just fall through the cracks. And when we say extremist, we don't necessarily mean violence. That's what they want. Literally, imagine the bell curve of American political thought. If you are on the extreme, as I imagine virtually every person in this room is, it means that you don't look at the mainstream discussion and think they actually have a solution for our problems. If we just vote in the right Republican, we can get the country back on the right track. If you don't believe that, you are by definition on the extreme. You are an extremist. And that's actually correct because obviously the mainstream paradigm of American political thought, American political discussion does not contain the solutions to our problems. Our party is not a legitimate opposition party. It exists not to represent us, but to contain us. And so you have to be comfortable entertaining ideas and, oh, you can't say that. Yes, I can. That's why they froze at Valley Forge, actually. So I could say that. Different things like that you have to be very willing to embrace. And so I view myself and my role as basically the toy maker. I take young men and I pick them up and I wind them up and I set them off in the right direction. I don't know where they're going to go, but hopefully it's somewhere right. I get them literally on the right track. And so that is how I view my job, and I take it very seriously. So I'm glad that I could be here this evening to uh, provide a little insight as to what my strategy is. I'm glad to be here alongside these guys. Great guys. They call him Jake the Lion of Dallas, who's going to speak after me. So thank you for listening to me, and I hope that we can collectively make America great again. I'm having to make some mental notes uh, going through listening to John's speech to make it a little bit more extreme. I've got to keep up. Um, <laughs> my name is Jake Collazer, and I'm the executive director of an organization called Keep Dallas Safe. Um, and it's actually a great job because everybody with a
brain agrees with me, which excludes most of the political class in Dallas, which is fine. I don't want to be friends with them. Most of you probably don't either. Um, the reason I say that everybody agrees with me is because if you live anywhere, if you exist, you're probably worried about homelessness in America. I don't really like to call it homelessness very much because most of these people are not simply lacking a home. Homelessness makes you think that they would like to have a home, but they simply don't have one. They don't have the means to get it. We use the word vagrancy typically because most of these people are vagrants. They want to loiter. They want to hang out. They want to get high. They want to ask you for money uh, when they could very well get a job of their own to pay their own rent, but they don't want to. And so the reason that Keep Dallas Safe exists is to combat crime and homelessness in the city of Dallas. And I do that through two primary ways. Ultimately, the goal is to pressure our local officials, whether they're city council members or the district attorney or the mayor or the city manager or any of these other people who get paid way too much money. The idea is to pressure them to do the right thing. And so I do that by pinpointing the problems, identifying what's going on in Dallas with vagrancy. Why is this an issue? Uh, identifying the reasons that crime is on the rise in Dallas, and then activating people uh, like yourselves who seek out this kind of information at, these, at this kind of group. And I give that information to you so that you can uh, know what's going wrong and who is responsible for it. We love to know that information. Who is responsible for all of the problems that we see? It's very, very important, and it can't be understated exactly how important it is. They don't usually want you to know that. So very similar to what John was saying here just a minute ago, a lot of the stuff that we see these days is because of mismanagement. A lot of it's because of the stupidity of the people involved. That's not the only reason. In fact, there is a lot of maliciousness. Um, a, lot of the pe a lot of what you see is done on purpose. And so something relevant to this organization that you're all very, very much aware of, uh, think about the Black Lives Matter riots of the past few years, whether it's 2020 or you go back to 2015 and 2016, a lot of the people that are involved in this, especially in cities like Portland or Seattle or LA uh, or New York City, a lot of the people who are perpetrating this are homeless people or people who are maybe not homeless but living off of the government dime, people who don't want jobs, people who are just, uh, the old word that they used, ne'er-do-wells, they used to just call them ne'er-do-wells. <laughs> That's the kind of people who are perpetrating these riots, who are activating these riots and burning down properties and killing people and destroying the fabric of our nation. And so it actually serves the interests of leftists. Whenever a leftist gets into a city government, it actually serves their purposes to have an underclass of seething people with no job prospects who totally rely on the generosity or the kindness of the state or the people, uh, the state or the city or the people who live there. And so I'll wrap it up here just a minute because I could go on uh, forever about this, um, but I'll tell you briefly some of the things that we do in order, to, uh, in order to, to raise awareness about these sorts of things. So every week I drive around Dallas. This is probably, I said I, I have the best job. This is the part of the job that's a little bit rough. It takes a, I have to give myself a little bit of a, a talk in the morning to get myself up to it. Once a week I drive around Dallas and I take photographs with a GPS stamp, a time stamp, uh, all this information to show where this camp is, that it was here on this date. I did this, I did this on Monday. And I take those photographs and I compile them and I send them with a letter to the city manager, to the council members, uh, I CC the chief of police and all these people, because it's illegal to camp in public places in the state of Texas. Penal code 48.05, it's illegal to camp in urban environments in the state of Texas. So this is illegal. So I'm wondering why the people in charge are not doing anything to clean this up. So I take these pictures to prove that they're there, to show where they are, asking them to do their very simple job of having the police go clear these places out and uh, get them off the streets. However, most of the time, these people are simply allowed to come right back to the place that they were. The city is basically a very expensive, taxpayer-funded maid service for vagrants. They go into a place, they clear out the homeless camp. Uh, it looks all clean. You drive past, and you're like, wow, they finally took care of that slum on Coit or on Empire Central or wherever, they finally took care of that slum, and then you drive by a week later and it looks exactly the way that it did before. And so we want to spread awareness of that and we do that through our newsletter. You can find all of this at keepdialsafe.org if you're interested. Um, 
but then through the newsletter, through our YouTube channel, through all of these things, I take that information in addition to the information about our district attorney, like the fact that he's Soros funded, he refuses to seek the death penalty for serial killers, all of these other things. I push this out hoping that people like you who care about this stuff can see that information and know what needs to be done. Uh, we also provide you with uh, ways to find out who your council members are and all of this and contact those people, asking them why they are not doing it. Because hopefully by the end of this, you know the answer. They don't want to. They want to this underclass like we've talked about. But we need to ask them. If a 1,000 people email one politician, that's a big deal. You think that because somebody's a politician, they're always getting emails, they're getting texts, their phone's blowing up constantly from social media. That's not true. If you look at most uh, politicians at the state level, especially at the city level, if they have 30 people in their notification saying, what in the world are you doing with this? That's a big deal. They go into panic mode. They're not used to that much attention. Most people don't care that much about them. And that really hurts their feelings. But whenever the spotlight gets shown on them, they become very uncomfortable. And that is when you start to see things change. So that is the purpose of Keep Dallas Safe. I'm sure we'll get into that in a little bit more. Um, but I'm very glad to be here. Uh, I'm very grateful to the True Texas Project for having me. Um, I've spoken at other groups before, and it's always a great time. And I love, I love the people here. So thank you all very much. If I just stand up, I don't, I don't know if I can do this sitting down. Hey, my name is Chad Cohen. I'm the president of Dallas County Young Republicans. We'll see if that works. Tonight, we're here to talk about and to try to understand the new generations that have entered the political arena. Well, Gen uh, X and millennials, and, and I'm sorry, baby boomers still hold most elected positions. Gen Z and millennials are beginning to have a real impact on American politics. I think that in order to understand my generation, the millennials, we have to answer three questions. One, who are millennials? What events shaped us? Two, what issues are important to us? And three, what do we want? What do we want America to be? We millennials are a generation all too acquainted with times of crisis and historic upheaval. For those of us born between 1981 and 1996, we're a generation that came of age during 9-11 and the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. In our formative years, sitting in our classrooms in school, is that out on me? It's just going in and out. It's okay, you won't hold me back. In our formative years, sitting in our classrooms in school, we experienced 9 11. We learned that attacks on American soil can happen, and that even the Twin Towers were susceptible to evil from across the world. We learned that America is vulnerable and that evil is real. As children, we took those lessons home. The war in Iraq left us deeply skeptical of American military intervention abroad and the wisdom of the leadership at the highest levels of the military. As teenagers, we listened as the US government struggled to explain to the American public exactly why we were in Iraq and what victory in Iraq looked like. We learned that the wise men running our military were not infallible. That skepticism has never left us. As the U.S. continues to send hundreds of billions of dollars to Ukraine and U.S. military leadership issues increasingly dire warnings about the necessity of Ukrainian victory, our generation remembers the lessons of Iraq. Millennials will not accept war without rationale or war without end. We entered college in the workforce just in time to experience the great financial crisis. The institutions on Wall Street, the big banks and global investment firms, were supposed to be the engines that would propel Main Street to better wages and better lives. The great financial crisis shattered that illusion for us. We learned that profits are privatized and losses are socialized for the largest institutions on Wall Street. The same lesson that we learned in American military intervention abroad held true in American finance. Large institutions and the individuals running them were playing a game of heads, we win, tails, you lose. Our generation remembers the lessons of the great financial crisis. We're skeptical of an economy that creates enormous wealth for those connected to institutional power while leaving entrepreneurs, working people, and young people vulnerable. 
We're skeptical of free trade policy and open borders immigration policy that destroy jobs and wages. We're skeptical that profits on Wall Street translate to prosperity on Main Street. We reached adulthood at the onset of the global pandemic. Having begun to build careers and families, we experienced the power of unchecked authoritarianism and the despotic nature of the experts. The experts assured us that surrendering our lives and our freedoms to their proclamations would save us. We learned that our freedom is vulnerable to attack from our own elected officials and just as importantly, from unelected bureaucrats. Lastly, we grappled and continue to grapple with the thief that is inflation. Inflation robs us of our wages. It steals the value of our earnings. While inflation represents capital gains for the few, it represents a punitive tax for the many. Our generation, still early in our careers, saving to buy homes and build families, has been robbed by inflation. Inflation created by endless money printing by the Federal Reserve and ever-increasing spending by the federal government. Inflation is not inevitable. It is the result of irresponsible monetary policy and runaway fiscal policy. As the price of everything from groceries to gasoline and cars to household items keeps skyrocketing, our generation has learned the hard lesson that failed government policy can steal money right out of our wallets. So that's who we are. That's what we've learned. What issues are important to us? What are we for? We're for a strong border and immigration system that prioritizes the prosperity and safety of American citizens above citizens of foreign nations. We're for tax and trade policies that prioritize entrepreneurs and working people above big business and billionaires. We're for monetary policy that prioritizes sound money and stable currency for savers above bailouts for Wall Street. We're for foreign policy that prioritizes the security and well-being of Americans at home above international crusades and quagmires. We're for a domestic energy supply chain based on the utilization of abundant, secure oil and gas that prioritizes affordable, reliable energy above the green energy fantasies of climate alarms. We know what we're for. I'll end by thinking about what our generation wants America to be, what we want our leaders to be. There are times of war and times of peace. For our generation, it's a time of war. Not a war on foreign soil, but a war right here. It's a war for American identity. I end on this note because I think this is the fundamental question facing our generation. Who do you believe in? Do you believe in the new gods of climate alarmism, racial identity, gender identity, or sexual identity? Do you believe in the god of science and its ministers, the experts? Do you believe in the god of social justice? Because make no mistake about it, the atheism of prior generations has been replaced by religious fervor. Our generation for the first time in many generations, lives in a time of faith. We will place our faith in some God. Much like in biblical times, there are many, many gods to choose from. It's my hope that our generation will place its faith in Jesus Christ and that we'll submit to and obey his commands. You see, the war for American identity is not about good faith disagreement between reasonable people over marginal tax rates and budget deficits. That's not the fight our generation inherited. It's a war about belief. This fight is about good and evil. And people tend to be uncomfortable when things get framed in terms of good and evil. But when you consider the mutilation of our children's bodies and minds, the poisoning of relationships between neighbors of radical ideologies, and the eradication of the nuclear family, there's no other word for it. Our country has been hijacked by cultural terrorists. Yeah. For the 9-11 generation, we know what to call this. This new breed of cultural terrorists seeks only destruction. The destruction of our police, our power grid, our quality of life, our faith in God. For cultural terrorists, destruction of our country is the goal. <clears throat> Defeating them 
And this relates to what we're doing here tonight, is a war for hearts and minds. One by one, we have to win the hearts and minds of those who have been brainwashed. We have to cleanse our institutions of those who work to undermine the freedom and prosperity of American citizens. Mm -hmm. Tonight, we're thinking about what young people want. Here's what I think. We're a generation searching for authenticity and starving for conviction. We might be afraid to say it, but we are yearning for true believers. Our generation is ready for leaders that speak the truth plainly. In our generation's fight, each of us has to answer a very simple question. Are you in or are you out? If you're in, if you're willing to join the fight, you're promised a hard road. Whether it's setbacks professionally, the loss of friends, exclusion from organizations, it'll cost you. But there is opportunity. The opportunity before our generation is to transform America into a moral nation that places its faith in God and submits to his commands. All right? Our generation won't be responsible for saving America. I believe that God is sovereign. But what we can do is we will pray for his guidance. We'll pray that our nation will turn to him. And then we'll get to work. We'll pray for his blessing on our work, and then we'll get to work. Thanks, guys. It's been quite a while since I felt like the lowest IQ person. Yeah. Here. <laughs> <laughs> Do you guys take notes on all that? There's a test after this. Uh, and I will let you guys know, we will be doing a Q&A after this. So if you guys want to start thinking of questions now, um, we do have a time frame and a time limit, but I want to make sure if you guys have questions, you can write them down or keep them in mind so we can make sure we get them answered. Uh, this is going to start kind of rapid fire, not, actually not rapid fire, but just kind of general questions. So just raise your hand and we'll go from there. Um, this generation's got a lot of stuff to go fight for with freedom in the future. What are the what are the biggest the biggest ways we can take effect with that? How can we make sure that tomorrow is going to be better and brighter than yesterday? I win. <laughs> go for it, Jake. Um, I think that um, this day and age, there there are a lot of uh, there's a lot of talk about where should young people. Where should young men and women spend their time? Should they retreat from the institutions and try to, because in the trades, as many of you probably know, you can make a good living in the trades, you can make a good living um, in a lot of businesses that don't require you to go through a traditional university education or they're required to do all this stuff. But the question that I would have regarding that is, is what, uh, what the ultimate goal is, what your ultimate goal is um, as an individual. Do you want to be able to have like a nice, comfortable life where you are successful in your private life? There's nothing wrong with that. But I would encourage you if you're, uh, I would encourage everybody, but especially young people who are starting out in this way, I think that the best way that we can guarantee that some kind of change will come in a positive direction is to bite the bullet, hold your nose, and go through these institutional processes that give you access to power. Because we have to get into a position where we're the decision makers. As of right now, this generation, the millennials or the Gen Zers coming up, uh, we don't have the boomers and uh, to some extent the Gen Xers are still around, they still have power, they're still making decisions. Uh, at a certain point though, that has to be handed over. But that can never be handed over if we don't have people, um, in some cases you may have to lay low through your university experience. If you're working for Goldman Sachs, you may have to lay low. Uh, if you're going, you know, if you're working in somebody's office and on the Capitol Hill or whatever, you may have to lay low, but we have to do that. We have to have that sort of mindset. The left infiltrated our institutions for a hundred years or so before they finally started taking action. And we need to have the same mindset. We need to know that we're in this for the long haul. And we need to go through, you need to become a, you need to become a doctor, you need to become a lawyer, you need to run for office, you need to keep yourself clean. You got to do, you got to have a, um, I like what Chad was saying about belief. Belief really matters. I was, uh, and, and this is the last thing I'll say, so I'm not drowning, but uh, I was reading uh, a quote from Oliver Cromwell earlier, and this is, this, to our modern sensibilities, this probably sounds pretty bad, but he said, I disembowel you for Christ's love. And if you look through his army, there was none of this, uh, there was no partying like there was on the, on the other side, on the royalist side. They weren't partying, they weren't drinking, there were people preaching, there were people praying. Uh, you need to have the same kind of sober-mindedness about the kind of fight we're in. The conservative movement is notorious. If you go to a lot of these events, 
there's a lot of drinking, there's a lot of partying. As long as you're responsible, like some of that is okay. You don't, you don't have to be a Puritan. You don't have to behave like you're in Cromwell's army. But you need to be sober-minded and you need to understand what's at stake. Thank you, Jay. Any other thoughts have anything to say on that topic? All right, man, we're just rocking and rolling. Um, so we've got a lot of threats coming up down the line. We've got a lot of stuff in the future that's coming to harm us, to take our rights away, to do a lot of things that are really going to just attack what this millennial and the younger generations are going for for America. What would you guys say are the biggest threats to our society right now? Yeah, so I'm going to come back to the idea about belief. So uh, the other side, the opposition, they aren't cynically claiming these positions. They sincerely believe these things that are not factual. And what we kind of have in today's society, and the reason you heard me talk so much about faith, is there's almost like a secular zealotry. So climate is my identity, it is my religion. Uh, transgenderism is my identity, is my religion. So I think there's a, a kind of old school Republican idea, well, if I have better facts that are logically presented, inevitably they'll acknowledge that I am right and they're wrong. Uh, that is not the world that we live in. And I think a big trap for Republicans, and especially as we talk about generational gaps, is this is not Ronald Reagan's Republican Party anymore. That's not saying anything positive or negative about Reagan. The world has changed, and we have to evolve with it. And what you have to understand is you were dealing with large segments of the population that are genuinely brainwashed. And I think rather than think on a big macro level, you are the most influential person within your professional network and with your social network. Nobody cares what the guys up here have to say, right? But your coworkers do, your family members do, your friends do. What I hope our generation will do is take ownership of our communities, right? And realize securing this thing for the future is going to be incumbent on us. But in terms of threats, the genuine belief that they have in these things that we know to be false, that scares the heck out of me. Awesome. Thank you, Chad. Mr. Doyle, you have anything on the topic? Yeah, I guess I would say that I think part of what causes our generation to be so in despair is, like I mentioned briefly, is the health aspect. I mean, 40% of my generation are overweight or obese. We're like openly professing sexually deviant identities. These people are disturbed and brainwashed. And until you can like cleanse them of that and make them physically, spiritually, and mentally healthy, they're always going to submit to whatever the identities of the state are because they feel that despair. And the propaganda apparatus tells them it's because of normal white guys who are really like quite friendly, actually. I don't know if you've ever encountered <laughs> white guys. Maybe sometimes they're a little goofy, but more or less they're like nice people to be around. And so they'll project all of that onto, onto us, normal white guys. And that's not good because, well, yeah, you kind of understand where that's going historically speaking, especially when they're talking about like eradicating whiteness, like these people take power, they're communists. It's not gonna end very well for us, I don't think. It should be ashamed. So I think it's very important to focus on that. You know, we need conservatives and Republicans legislating issues of health, getting the poisons out of our food packaging, out of our water, out of our clothing, actually, even. Uh, and until we do that, I don't think, you know, we'll just be buying ourselves time, essentially. We won't really solve the root of the problem. Awesome. Thank you, sir. So we've had a lot of uh, doom and gloom a little bit so far. But with all, the, with all this doom and gloom, I just want to know, what do you guys think is our generation and the younger generation, future generations, biggest strengths that they can bring to the table that have been missing so far? I think that, I think one, one positive, and this is especially true for the people who are just below me age-wise, so I'm 26, so I kind of straddle the line. You gave the cutoff in 96, I was born in 97, so I like really kind of straddle the line between these two generations. And this is, I, like John was saying, I do still remember the world before it was like crazy like this. I don't really have much recollection of the world before 9-11, but I do remember the world from 9-11 up until 2014, where at least like, you know, we might have we might have been in wars that we shouldn't have been involved in. We might have been, uh, you know, the country was doing things that we shouldn't have been, but like there weren't people in public molesting children. I remember that world. Um, the good thing about the fact that this new generation that's coming up below me is these people are very, they will be very, they will be totally disabused of the philosophy that has governed the world since World War II, basically. The Cold War ideology that had to, they will be totally, they will, it won't matter to them. Like it's already happening now. Like imagine if somebody called you a Nazi 25 years ago or a Klansman or what a racist, whatever. 
if they called you that 25 years ago, probably would, you would have at least thought, like, why am I being called that? That's not good. Nowadays, it's run of the mill, it's normal, nobody cares. They will, imagine what that'll be like for people who are 10 years old now, what the world will be like in that regard. So in that way, it'll be good. They won't be beholden by some of these ideals that are kind of holding us down in a way. Um, that's what I was saying. Jake's point, it is true. In order to have a revolution, when I say that, I mean like a change of power and transfer of regime, so to speak. You need people to be fundamentally like disgruntled with the way things are. And as long as people have reasonable access to food, entertainment, they're not really going to want to get involved in a real messy political battle. You know, they've got their 401ks, they've got their house, they've got a Mercedes, maybe a summer home. Kids who are my age, well, I'm not a child, but kids in this country, they don't have that. They're almost like Joker in the movie Joker when he's like, I've got nothing left to lose. They look towards the horizon and don't see anything good. And overwhelmingly, they're very far left, very liberal. But the ones who are right wing are like actually insane. They're like schizophrenic. You look at the, the memes they're posting, they're referencing very far right literature. Like they're on the right track. So that's going to be very helpful for us. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just chime in real quickly. So I'm the president of Dallas County and Republicans. And I can tell you, you know, in 2019, we'd have 12, 15 people at a meeting. Now we regularly have 200 people. Yeah. What does that wow. show me? That doesn't have anything to do with our board leadership. There's hunger in this generation for authenticity, for truth, and for action, right? And especially for millennials and Gen Z that are conservative, we've seen our peers on the left kind of soak up all the attention since the Obama era. I think the cards are much more on the table. I think Jake's pretty insightful about that. that it's hard to hide in today's culture. We just sort of say the thing. But what I'm starting to hear more and more of is millennials and Gen Z say the thing. And so I think we're resilient. I talk about all the, the crises we've lived through. We live in a perpetual state of crisis, and we're still here, and we're not casting our chips yet. We're resilient, we're optimistic, and we're reaching a point where we're finally starting to recognize, and I'm sorry, there's some baby boomers in here, we can't wait on y'all to save us. It's on us to assume <laughs> accountability and true. responsibility for our country. It's true. Yeah. So in, all, in each of y'all's missions, you guys are all fighting for the culture, all fighting for the right wing, fighting to protect America and stand up for what we're fighting for. How can we in the room, how can people help you guys? How can we augment your mission? Yes. Anyone? Um, so I'll go quick. Uh, my, so with my job, this stuff is very easy, but it applies, to, it applies to everything. So there's like the easy level thing that I would just say everybody can do. If this stuff matters to you, you can do this. You can figure out who your council member is, or who your state rep, or state, state senator, or your US rep, whatever. You can find out who that is, and you can either figure it out yourself, what they're doing right or wrong, or you can subscribe to a newsletter for an organization that will tell you. And you can call them, and you can email them, and you can make their, you can be very annoying, and, and, and that actually does have an effect. Um, at, the mo at the most basic level, you can do that, and we won't really get anywhere else until we at least all of y'all are invited to Dallas County Young Republicans. Yay. We are very welcoming of people of all ages. We have an event with RPT Chairman Matt Rinaldi Tuesday night at Ozona. I hope I see everyone in this room there. Uh, so I'd love for you to come get involved. Y'all are modeling behavior for young Republicans, right? Somebody earlier said, how do I balance careers and kids and families and friends? Y'all are doing that, right? And we want to show why ours you can have a balanced life like that. So come attend our events, let's work together. I was in trouble with someone earlier tonight, right when I walked in, for we were not responsive on the website. We're not always perfect, and it's the blame lies with me. But uh, reach out for ways we can collaborate. Events like this are fun. We want real Republicans of all ages to start meeting each other. Because I think that's the logical next step for all the organizations everyone's building is you stay siloed in whatever your affinity group is initially, Ultimately, we're all on the same team here. I don't know how much trouble you want me to get everybody into right now, but there's a lot of people in Texas that have R next to their name that have literally nothing to do with what we believe in. Yeah. And so I don't care if you're 85 years old or if you're 18 years old. Let's get together, let's join forces, and let's mobilize. Because, again, I don't think that labels or identity or background are particularly relevant when we're in, what, week two of an impeachment trial against the sitting attorney general. Led by Republicans, so that's right. Yeah. Hosted by Obama DOJ appointees. Yeah. Yeah. Where, where's that thing Tuesday? Ozona. Ozona. Yeah.
Yeah. SMU Boulevard and Greenville Avenue in Ozona. Come by at 6 30, event starts at 7. There will be an open bar. <laughs> I think uh, the way our system is structured, it doesn't read a class of statesmen that are actually like people with agency, which is why when someone like uh, RFK Jr. comes along or Donald Trump comes along, we're so refreshed to see somebody, Vivek Ramaswamy for that matter, who can actually like speak about things like they're not a robot. And so part of the reason we've had such failure from these people isn't because they're necessarily malicious, maybe the degree to which they're incompetent is malicious at a certain point, but it's really just because they're getting bullied into doing the bidding of people who are evil. And if you can match that by being equally as annoying, they'll crumble. You be surprised. You get a bunch of senior citizens you know, knocking on doors, sending emails, snail mail, I don't know if you guys still do that, but you can actually yeah. <laughs> So we've got lots of doom and gloom still, but some good stuff coming up. So a lot of people feel like the right, we keep losing, we keep failing, we keep missing, we keep like losing our ground. How does the right turn this ship around? How do we go ahead and take this and start getting more victories and grow the culture, grow the cause? And then on top of that, like what's, what's some fuel to get people fired up to go and turn that ship around as well? I think it's exactly as a chat outline where we don't actually exist independently of the left. We're not really a right, we're more of like a counter left. Like if I were a passerby and you asked me to define what the right is and I wasn't seeing Dylan Mulvaney and Bud Light and Hunter Biden, I wouldn't know. I mean, well, we don't like Hunter Biden, we don't like trans people because they're annoying, but we also have like Blair White who is somebody who attends events for some reason. There's very weird incongruencies. We have to find a way to define our own path forward with a lot of the issues that we've mentioned tonight instead of just being like, well, we definitely don't like what they're doing. It's like, okay, well, we have to be able to stand on our own independently from that because ultimately what attracts people is strength, is vision. You know, we're going to want the stronger horse over the weaker horse. And we keep losing because of not only that, but also we are so eternally afraid of being called names by these people. People who otherwise, you wouldn't value their opinion on anything, but we are so afraid of having maybe an article written about us in media matters. Ooh, or maybe our relative doesn't want to go uh, to our Thanksgiving party anymore. It really doesn't matter, especially with like what is at stake. So we have to be willing to do that and stop caving to their moral framework. The moral framework, by the way, of people who are trying to cut your kids' genitals off. Like that's whose opinion people are concerned about. Yeah. I, I think we need to get in the game, right? For at least 10 years now, we have been playing two different games. We're talking about uh, you know, funding Social Security through 2050, and they're talking about we're going to imprison people that were capital on J6. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not even playing the right game. Mm -hmm. And so I think the opportunity here, and what I'm excited about is, is, again, like old labels are irrelevant. Ultimately, there's a coalition between entrepreneurs, working people, young people, people of disenfranchised backgrounds. Effectively, if you're not the CEO of a Fortune 500 company, I think you're a Republican. And there's a lot of opposition from traditional Republicans uh, about this kind of economic populism. Um, I think that's really, really interesting because the underlying theme in American politics right now is contempt for the people in this room. They hate you, they think you're stupid, and they think you're lazy. Everything they do is designed to make you give up. My confidence level comes from the fact that I don't see anybody giving up in this room. And I think the numbers are going to keep growing and growing and growing. And this institutional class, I find them pretty weak when you actually come in contact with them. They're not used to head-on conflict, right? The institution is what they derive their power from, not their ideas, not who they are. So what am I optimistic about? I think we have a brand new coalition of people that are making up the rules as they go, and I think our opposition is ultimately weak. I think what we're seeing in 2024 is if we can't lock people in their homes, and they're going to try and they'll fail, how do we steal this election? And who cares what they write to me? I think everybody up here might be called white nationalist at, at some point. I'm half Jewish, but don't tell anybody that. And uh, I really should have said that. But, uh, but, but no, like, why do we care about media publications that aren't designed to investigate the truth or tell us things we don't already know? We don't need to engage them on their terms. People in rooms like this is where change happens. Any of you on that, Jake? Ditto. That's really good. Very good. Very solid. Um, on, on the topic of coalitions, Chad, 
You and I and a few people have been working on some pretty cool stuff coming up. Do you want to elaborate on what we've been doing to build coalitions around the state of Texas? Yeah, so uh, what's happening with adults is happening with young people as well right now. There is a schism in the Republican Party. And what tends to happen is the establishment, uh, we who do not define ourselves that way, we tend to make a lot of allowances for them. We say, well, if you just leave me alone, I don't really care what you do. Or, or maybe you antagonize me a little bit, but that's okay. And so what's happened with young Republicans really across Texas is we have a statewide organization that voted to disaffiliate from the Republican Party of Texas. We have a statewide organization that's been pretty clear in its support for the impeachment, uh, impeachment proceedings against Ken Paxton. And what we at Dallas Young Republicans, Rockwall Young Republicans, and a handful of other uh, wire groups across the state have decided is we're not going to contribute time and member money to organizations that are actively working against rank and file members. That's the story of American politics in the 21st century. Organizations working against their rank and file members. So what we're doing in Texas, the answer for this, is we're building a new statewide wire organization. We're America first, we're Texas first, we're not gonna apologize for that, we're not hiding from it. And rather than try to build profile for ourselves or play Game of Thrones about things that don't matter, <laughs> what we're here to do is we're here to grow local chapters, resource and empower, people in whatever county they might be in, let's go grow. Because can I, can I give everybody the simple, simple formula for go how you grow things? You know, if you have successful professionals, fun people, cool people, and nice venues, things will grow very, very quickly. And I think any organization can do that over six months. So uh, we're really excited to build this new statewide organization. Uh, somebody told me I was going to be chairman of it. So I, I don't yep. know. Oh, okay, so that's what happened. <laughs> Texas, and if you don't agree with us, that's okay too. We can actually handle disagreement, unlike the establishment wing of the party. So we're going to start giving voice to people that say Texas first, America first, that are under 35. We're really excited. Awesome. Do you have a ditto on that, Jake? Sure do. Okay. <laughs> so that meeting with Rinaldi on Tuesday is going to be interesting. Yes, we're very so we're going to have Matt Rinaldi, and I, believe it or not, we have him scheduled before uh, the, the drama of recent weeks. Um, I guess I am old-fashioned where I believe it's important for grassroots organizations to be affiliated with the state party. I think that's especially important when we have a state chairman who has actually started taking positions, saying, I don't care about an R next to your name. I care about what you stand for and what you vote on. So uh, I hope you get me on record. I'm behind Matt Rinaldi all the way. Our membership's behind Matt Rinaldi all the way. So we're excited to have him. Awesome. Awesome, awesome. So more doom and gloom, but uh, not really doom and gloom. But what are you guys excited for in the future? I know this is kind of like not redundant, but still pretty close to the other questions, but do you guys have anything that you're just like really excited for for the future? Something that's like the, your star in the sky, something that's got you fired up that you're like, this is gonna be freaking awesome. Uh, yeah, uh, total victory. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think um, I am optimistic. Um, some, people, some people think that that's great to be optimistic. It gives you something to fight for. It gives you something that, that motivates you. Some people think that I'm too optimistic. Um, I don't know that, that it will happen, this victory. I don't know that it will happen in our lifetimes. Uh, if, even the youngest generation, I don't know that, that it will happen in that time. But I think it's very encouraging to look at what's going on around us in the federal government, at the state government, wherever. There's incompetence everywhere. And the good thing about incompetence, it, you know, it'll, it'll ruin a lot of things, it'll ruin a country, it'll ruin a country, but uh, it only works for so long. You can only go for so long if you have incompetent people running the show. The other good thing is if they're your opponents, if they're your enemies, it's really good to have incompetent enemies. Um, I'll take that over, you know, evil masterminds any day. So uh, I am optimistic. I do think that, that they've gone too far, and I think that people are very upset about it. I think that this new generation who's coming up who has no memory of the good times, they don't remember when interest rates were really good. They don't remember when, uh, you know, when they could get a good, when wages were like keeping up with inflation. They don't remember anything like that. And I think that what we are seeing is that even though they've never experienced it, that there is a select portion of that generation, of this generation, that is willing to go out and create good times for themselves because nobody else is going to do it for them. Um, and I think that's, I think that that is a, uh, a huge white pill, as they say on the internet. And I think that, uh, you know, an organized, passionate majority or minority who is committed to these things can do, they can punch well above their head. 
Chad, John? Uh, yeah, I guess I would echo Jake's point a little bit, where as a content creator, I am trained not to view the world through the lens of right, wrong, safety, danger. I simply view it as, is this good content or is this bad content? And I think that my lifetime is going to be filled with lots of good content, because the regime that we have now is not acting in a way that would demonstrate their confidence to maintain power. The way that they so incessantly spread their propaganda throughout, I mean, even when you go to a urine lab, you know, like the male restroom, you see a screen there and there's like advertisements and they all have mixed race couples and gay people and all this stuff. This is not the action that would be taken by a regime that's really confident in its ability to maintain power. Mm -hmm. And typically what tends to happen throughout history is as they start doing that, kind of firing on all cylinders with their mm -hmm. propaganda, in the background they start to put together the infrastructure to start to wield actual power. These would be your arrests, your persecutions, things like the uh, federal government defining the greatest domestic terror threat as white nationalism, yep. white supremacy, which is to say anybody who thinks like America is not doing so well and should be better again, that's what that is. That's what the J6 stuff is. That's what all of that is. The mobilization of our nat uh, national security apparatus against American patriots, that is them preparing for when it gets to that point. <coughs> and typically when it reaches that sort of hour of decision, whatever the organized minority is at that point is going to basically take over the levers of power. And I hope that would be our guys because we could very well be guys who are even farther left than what we have now. I mean, if you think our regime is bad now, communists are actually far more organized than the right is in many regards. And they would make the people we have now look like Fred Rogers. So that's why we do kind of have a sort of urgency to the action that we're taking. Because there's going to reach a point where that hour of decision comes, and it has to be us. It certainly can't be whoever else is going to fill those shoes because it's not going to be very favorable to real American patriots. Yeah, the stakes are so high. Right, I, I was president of college Republicans at SMU, and back then we used to argue about, should the tax rate be 27% or 28%? <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll be honest with you, it wasn't a particularly motivating or animating fight. What we're in now, it's existential. This is the big game. Some people get up in the big game, some people don't. Um, I think it's fun to be in the big game, right? This is for all the marbles. So I think the passion, the energy that's required here, we have the opportunity to remake this country. Like America, the next 50 years, will have no relationship to what it's been. And the victor is going to write what this thing looks like. I agree that it's not going to be us that benefits from it. It's not an America I'm going to partake in. Kids, grandkids, it'll be for them. So I think it's an awesome responsibility that we have to have this great fight for what is this country. And, and kind of to something that said earlier, no one's really hiding anymore. They say what they really mean. Uh, we've heard some ideologies espoused in America today that 10 years ago were, were unthinkable. And uh, I think there's a chance for America to be better than it's ever been, frankly. Um, you know, 10 years ago, I was frankly uncomfortable to talk about faith in public. That seemed inappropriate to me. And I think a lot of us have had an awakening the last few years about why is it acceptable for people to talk about uh, things that are just demonstrably insane and wicked, but we who are Christians are afraid to speak up. And that's been a failing of mine in the past, and uh, I want to make sure that I correct that going forward, and I hope all of us in this room do as well, because ultimately, there is truth. And they're trying to shove their truth down your throat. It's false. It needs to be called what it is. It needs to be rejected and defeated. So I'm excited. This is for all the marbles, and if we win, I think we can truly live in a better world. And I know how naive that sounds. I know how cheesy that sounds. But I think that's what's possible. So cheesy, Chad. Thank you. <laughs> no, it's good, it's good. So we've got time for Q&A now. Does anybody have any questions they'd like to answer? You, ma'am. Um, the Young Republicans Party, I'd love to know your position on paper ballots, because the uh, Dallas County Republican Party, they're really waffling on it, even though the, the National Party said, we want to go to paper ballots, so what do we Yeah, let me answer your question indirectly. So every year within mm -hmm. Young Republicans, we do an internal debate discussion, and we usually have about 150 people show up. We do panelists like this, but we really use them as a jumping off point for the audience to participate, right? And so it's a great opportunity to hear how 150 people think. And what's so interesting to me about that is we have elected officials who spend all their time sitting around speculating about what they think. They can just come to a Young Republicans meeting and hear right from the horse's mouth. And so here's the answer to your question. Every year we ask, what are the most important issues to you from a public policy perspective? And every single year, the answer is one, two, and three, the southern border. Now, that's still very confusing people. One, two, and three, illegal immigration. When they get past that, it's the idea of election fraud. 
Confidence in our elections amongst young people is at or near zero. None of them believe that we have a valid, fair, transparent election process. Mm -hmm. And usually I think y'all might agree, what the left accuses us of doing is generally what they're actually doing. Right, yeah. So when they talk about uh, undermining democracy and undermining confidence in, in democratic institutions, I, I can tell you I see the rot of that with young Republicans and that everyone just default assumes we're being cheated out of this. And it's sort of like, I don't even know if it matters if we vote or not because the outcome is so hopeless. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna be even more honest than I should be. In terms of the mechanics of how we solve uh, election processes at the local level, I certainly don't have the fix. Uh, I think the, the concern here is the administrators of these elections, if they're acting from a place of malfeasance and without accountability, how does one correct that? So uh, I don't have a great answer, but what I can tell you is I've seen kind of the negative result of this loss of confidence in elections amongst young people, because ultimately what it does is it drives down participation from our folks and it drives up participation from the other side. So awesome. how do you feel about paper ballots? <laughs> how I feel about it is I'm not qualified to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. All right, Lola, would you like the next question? Yes, please. Thank you. So Jake mentioned he's 26. If I could be so bold to ask, gentlemen, the other two, what are your ages? Mm. And then you referenced the southern border. What is y'all's recommendation? What should be done, and why is it not being done on the southern border? How old do I look to you? <laughs> oh, that's never fair. Oh, I'm not going to be offended by it. I'm not a woman. <laughs> <laughs> Now, they might try to obfuscate that and say, guys, what you don't understand is how complex this is. 
Well, Donald Trump connected with a lot of people because he said, I'm going to build a giant wall. <laughs> Guess what? A giant wall will stop people from entering the country. Mm -hmm. uh, Tucker Carlson criticized Greg Abbott this week mm -hmm. and yes, essentially made the same claim that this is a lack of political will from the governor of Texas. Rather than expend energy and effort making excuses about why you can't constitutionally address this, why don't you figure out a way to make it happen? Send more people down there, right? This can be done. They just don't want to. It's great for Republican electeds because you get to run on the same issue every two years, every four years. It's great for Democrats. It's a new voting base around. I think the economic undertones of this are what's most interesting because, you know, large corporations, these are cheap labor employees. They're not human beings. But for middle class or working class uh, voters out there, these are competitors. And they're unfair competitors because mm -hmm. they can undercut your wager. So it's an existential threat for certain classes of people. And I think that's a huge part of the reordering of the two parties, right? Yeah, um, age, age first, age first, uh, age first. I'm 26 again. Uh, <laughs> cool. Just making sure. So, I'm 26 years old. Uh, I'm a Taurus. You drive a Taurus? I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> You're married. I think that for those of us in Texas who are talking about border security, and the immigration issue because I can't, immigration is the number one issue that we face. Like Chad said, it's the issue one, two, and three. It might as well be issues one. It doesn't, there's no other issue until we get this solved. There's other things we can patch up holes in the ship until we get this solved. But if we have, right now there's roughly like 30 million, a little bit under 30 million people in the state of Texas that we know of. If you import 40 million people from somewhere else, just to take an extreme example, it's not the same place anymore. And so if you replace, if you physically replace the people who are descended from the people that founded this country, you don't have the same country. And so what that means is, unfortunately, you know, we don't know how the federal situation is going to go. Maybe we'll get to a point where the margin is so big they can't cheat. We don't know. But for now, since we are kind of, at least for the time being, in a holding position, locked out of the federal government, people involved in state politics are going to have to be ready to make some difficult decisions whenever we are running state. We're going to have to decide if we're going to do what the federal government says. Uh, you have you even have gubernatorial candidates talking about this now. I worked on the Huffines campaign. It's talking about we're not going to listen to the federal government. We're going to make abortion illegal and we're going to stop the invasion of the southern border. That has to be something that we have the, that we develop the political will to do whenever we take power. And whatever, and whenever that is, we have to be willing to resist not just the people in this state who want to turn it into a communist hellhole. We have to be able to resist the people that are above us in the hierarchy and trying to do unjust, unjust uh, injustices to the people that we serve. Awesome. Thank you, fellas. Any other questions? Okay, just a couple questions. All right. Uh, Brian Bodie, back there. You want to go for it? Okay. okay. Uh, so for anybody on the panel that wants to take it, if y'all can hear me okay. So what is your sense of where the Zoomers are at that are graduating from college right now? As we all know, academia is 90% leftist faculty, liberals, liberal curriculum, especially in you know, the liberal arts. So where are the Zoomers at right now? These are the 21, 22, 23 or four years. Are they losing faith in the higher education institutions? Where do you think this is going? Where do you think it's at right now? As a non-Zoomer, I'll say there appears to me to be a strain of, of almost economic nihilism amongst that age bracket, where home ownership, they almost accept that's just an impossible dream. Uh, I'm kind of the age where maybe we got lucky, I hate to tell y'all, it can be tough out there, uh, in the home buying market. So I think you see people that start prioritizing the experience economy over saving for retirement, saving by a home, because what's the point? I think that Zoomers have the most economically bleak picture of anybody. Uh, and I think that's an issue they're gonna be grappling with. Um, in my interactions with Zoomers, what I'm always struck by, though, is what a failure we had as conservatives to engage with the culture. We lost the culture so completely, um, it can be difficult to communicate with people at that age because what they think to be normative or what they think to be appropriate is so different from what we came up with. Um, they enforce very rigidly kind of this regime mentality around what's acceptable to say, what's not acceptable to say, and they really, more than any other generation, suffer the social repercussions of daring to be different, right? They have to stay within established norms far more than guys that are 33 years old do. So I think they have a very bleak economic picture. I think they've been very, very culturally influenced because conservatives have not engaged in popular culture whatsoever the last 20 years. 
Um, so I think it's interesting, but I think what you find is what they're posting on TikTok, some of them will throw out grenades, absolutely. And I think that repression that they've been facing is starting to burst in some ways. So I think in a lot of ways, you're gonna have less mediated content, right? What Hollywood's releasing doesn't matter. They're gonna fight it out directly on TikTok in ways that can't be censored is my suspicion. Hmm. This is the resident uh, authentic Zoomer. <laughs> my generation, use the accumulation of debt to basically be a lily pad, and then maybe they'll be able to get a house someday, but uh, it's absolutely true. We view it as sort of like, well, I'll just, you know, spend money on experiences and having fun and like, you know, vape and marijuana and these other things. They really don't have like a sort of long-term plan to own a home and save for retirement. Maybe some of the finance bros will, you know, get involved in their 401k or things like that. There's sort of this subculture that's uh, accumulated in the wake of the Wolf of Wall Street, you know, the finance bros, guys like that. But the average person, I mean, they're going to college, they're getting the debt, and they're not even pursuing something that they're really passionate about. They're like, okay, well, I have to go to college to get a job. I kind of enjoyed my chemistry class in high school, so I guess I'll go get like a six-year degree in biochemistry. This makes sense to me because I'm not intelligent. I shouldn't be in college in the first place. That's the other thing. Why did we democratize education? The average IQ of somebody graduating from college has dropped like a standard deviation in the last 20 years. I don't know if you guys know this, but the greatest predictor of job performance is not education, not even job experience, it's IQ. But that's offensive. So then we made that illegal and said, okay, then the college degree became the proxy for are you intelligent? Do you have things like the SAT, the ACT? Those are IQ tests. Those are, I mean, virtually your correlation between your IQ and your ACT, SAT score is like one to one. But now they're saying that those are offensive. They're phasing those out too. So we are going to have such a class of incompetent people going into these positions. So if you have a son or a daughter who's relatively intelligent, maybe they'll be able to do it. But for the most of us, we're not going to make it. And they're going to be very disaffected and very upset about it, I think, which is a good thing for them. But it is true nonetheless. Actually, and you know, that does provide, a, that does provide an opportunity, though, because if we can take our issues and channel them towards those people yeah. and appeal to them. Think about immigration, for example. Immigration affects education. It affects being able to purchase a home. It affects jobs and wages and things like that. Why would we build a country for Americans and then give it to people who are not American? That doesn't exactly make any sense. And even though there is a lot of propaganda conditioning saying that Americans suck, we're only great because we let everybody else in to sort of this like middle zone, that's not true. America is a great country because of American people. And you can actually reach that within people if you simply have the courage and the will to say it. And they understand that because there is this sort of tribalistic mentality we have that maybe we think we're more progressive than, but it is true. You start telling young people who can't afford homes, who can't get jobs, who have been deprioritized for a college they dreamed about going to their entire lives because of some immigrants, some illegal, I don't know. They will actually get angry and they will understand, wait a minute, this is the party that maybe only nominally at this point, but they are at least talking about immigration being the top issue. I'll bounce off that really quick. Um, this, so conservatives have been kind of, we've been on the back foot for a long time, for a couple decades now. It's like one, one thing after another keeps knocking us backwards. We can't get our feet under us. We can't figure out what's going on. People have been trying to do the identity politics stuff. The left does identity politics. Conservatives try to do it. Not in the not in the young Republicans of Texas anymore, but uh, where they where they extend a hand to these gay groups or these minority groups, or they try to pander to these things. It's actually very effective, and, and this is a secret that the government doesn't want you to know. There is another. There is like an alternate identity that is uh, that is like very useful for acting people, activating people politically, and it's American identity. If you don't feel like you're in one of those groups, it's probably because you belong in this country. If you don't feel like you're one, part of one of those minority, whether it's sexual minority, ethnic minority, whatever, if you don't feel at home in that coalition, it probably means that you actually belong in this country. And other people are in that same situation. And so if you can activate those people's like political, politically by talking to them about American identity. And I don't mean like this, you know, you shouldn't be evangelizing people like, you know, Brother John, did you know? <laughs> Do you know that uh, the American identity exists? Um, but it does, the people that built this country are real, we're still here. If you have a, a, an ancestor that was on the Mayflower or uh, Jamestown or something like that, if you don't, if you do anything but keep your mouth shut politically, you're an enemy of the state. So you are, a, there is a political interest group there. So just kind of a tangential off of uh, what John was saying, but 
Um, both if of I them may, mentioned that, and I think it's I think it's very important. If I may be tangential to what you were saying as well, <laughs> with, we can ignore that, but the other side knows that's true. Because think about how diverse a co. I mean, that's their whole thing is we're diverse. How in the world could you unite such a diverse group of people into a political coalition? You're talking about people who are homosexuals, transsexuals, Somalians, Mexicans, and you look and they move into neighborhoods and they're in proximity and they don't get along, but how can they all vote for the same party? It's because the overriding ambition of that party is a hatred for America and for American identity. These immigrants come here, they're not even immigrants in the traditional sense, they're colonists. They come here and they wave their flag, they tell us that our culture is bland, we don't have a culture, okay. And we're supposed to just go along with that. So if they don't have that unifying contempt and frankly envy for what we built in America for Americans, they will not exist as a political coalition. So we have to channel that energy while we still have it on our side. And that's why it is America first, it is American identity, putting our people first. That's why it's so important. Awesome. Unfortunately, as much as I wish we had time for like a million more questions because these are really good questions. We do have a time limit on the room, so we do have to get ready to pack up. Um, so that, that's going to be the end of the event for the evening. I apologize, guys. However, a few of us are going to Honor Bar after this, so I don't know if all these guys are coming, but you guys are more than welcome to come join us and come ask these guys questions if they decide to show up. But I'm going to bring Lola Hurt back up here to kind of close us out. Thank you, guys. this as much as I did. I think these young men are amazing, and I think if others are like that, our country is going to go forward in a mighty way. I think each of you should run for office as quick as you're of age. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Again, thank you guys for coming out so very much. Um, thanks, Chris, for uh, moderating. Uh, feel free, anybody wants to come up, take pictures with these uh, handsome young men in front of a True Texas Project sign, please. Um, remember, our date is uh, October 12th for our next meeting. Um, if anybody would like to volunteer, look at this amazing fun we have. Uh, we'd love to have you on our team. Um, again, thanks for being here. Have a safe drive home. God bless. Before you leave, you must get a piece of cake. Yes, and please grab cake on the way out. Um,